Uh, good evening, everyone. My name is Neil Redfern. I'm the executive director of the Council for British Archaeology. And these two weeks in July are our annual Festival of Archaeology. So I'm here and delighted to be able to introduce you to the National Trust team for an evening with National Trust archaeologists. We have a, literally a panel, a bevy of archaeologists at your beck and call to talk to you about the work of the National Trust. And I am delighted um, with our partnership with the National Trust around the festival and all the activities um, they have been doing. Um, the CBA team, we're going to be in the background helping the National Trust do this. This is their evening. And so I'm delighted to introduce Shannon Hogan, the National Archaeologist at the National Trust, whose role is to focus on engagement, to introduce her team, introduce the presenters and lead you through the evening. Please, if you've got any questions, can you use the Q&A function? Um, and then we will be able to capture those questions and put them to the panel and the group of archaeologists as they go along. Um, please use the chat if you want to say hello to anyone else or say where you're joining from or if you've got any comments you actually want to make. And without further ado, I'm going to pass over to Shannon now. I'm going to go hide in the background and be listening in. And I wish you all a really fantastic evening. You're in for a treat tonight. Shannon, over to you. Thank you, Neil. Um, I just saw just quickly someone pop up and said they're from Houston, Texas, which is incredible. So we do get a really interesting mix of people from all over the world come to these evenings. Um, so yes, some of you may know, here we are, third year in. This is the third year that we've run this uh, in conjunction with the CBA. Um, I find it funny sometimes thinking about presenting this, given that before I joined the National Trust, I didn't even know that we had archaeologists in the National Trust. Uh, but six and a half years down the line, I've been here. Now, I've got the honour of saying that I work with some of the most knowledgeable and fascinating archaeologists I've met in my entire career. And that's no offence meant to anybody here who might be on the call who I've worked with in the past. Um, not only that, but they're actually a bloody nice bunch of people as well. So I feel very fortunate. Um, I should also say that my boss, the head of historic environment for the National Trust is lurking on this call as well. I just want to point that out. So as well as Neil and the team from CBA, we do have some secret archaeologists stashed in the background so they can tackle some of the questions that might come up, uh, some of the broader questions that might not be sort of specific about the presentations. So before I tell you a little bit about uh, who's going to be talking this evening, I just want to say that we are really, really grateful to be working with the CBA on this again for, for a third year running, as I say. We've been developing, I think, a really strong working relationship with these guys through their Festival of Archaeology, and we're always on the lookout for more opportunities to support the work that the, that the CBA are doing. <clears throat> So uh, without giving you too much detail, as you'll see from these four presentations, there's such a range of work going on with our archaeology team. And what better way to learn about it than to hear straight from the horse's mouths, as it were. Again, no offense meant, guys. We've got four speakers tonight. So we're going to start with Natalie Cohen, who works in the southeast. And she'll be telling you a bit about the surprising results from some of the archaeological research at Small Hythe Place. Then we're going to go to Mark Newman, who is up in the northeast. <clears throat> He'll tell you uh, what they've learned from excavating in the gardens of Benenborough Hall. Then we're going to go back down south with Gary Webster, who's going to whiz through, I've got to say this right, <clears throat> a plethora of partners and projects involving people and places in the South Downs. There you go. I thought that kind of captured everything, Gary. Um, I'm being deliberately vague here because I want them to really express all the detail of these projects. And then finally, we're going to finish with Duncan Coe, who's heading up the growth of one of our volunteer initiatives to monitor and support the ongoing care of our archaeological assets and the National Trust. So as Neil said, please pop any questions in the chat. Uh, sorry, nope, the Q&A box, not the chat. So we'll come to those at the end of the four presentations. So grab your drinks, grab your snacks, sit back. And without further ado, I'm going to hand over first to Nat to reveal the secrets from Small Hive. Okay. Can everyone hear me okay? I can hear you loud and clear. Can everyone see the presentation okay? I've got it. Yep. Excellent. Okay. I will kick off with a talk about Small Hive uh, in Kent. So, Hello everyone, thank you for joining us this evening. Um, just to situate you, for those of you who aren't familiar with um, the site, the site lies to the north of the Isle of Oxney and we're essentially almost on the Kent-Sussex border. An amazing landscape around us, we're sort of just up into the high ground 
and to our east we've got the reclaimed land of the Romney and Wolland marshes so it's a really dynamic landscape and it's essentially in the past would have been a coastal landscape so we're looking at a landscape that has changed very much over time. Here we can see an aerial view of the site so we're looking downriver the river Rother runs to the right hand side of the screen here um, and it's now a small channel called the Reading Sewer, but in the past it was a much mightier river um, flowing out to sea, which is now about 10 miles away, but as I said earlier, was much closer to us in the past. In the foreground, you can see the Elfwick field, which is uh, part of our holding. Right in the centre of the picture, um, you can see Smallhide Place. If I wave the cursor, hopefully you're able Nat, to see. Can I pause you for a second? Oh. Yeah. Can I just double, there's just comment in the chat. Someone said they can see the speaker, but the slides are in the corner. So I just want to check. Oh, uh, oh someone, someone's been very helpful. Click hide video panel if you can find it. I think that's to the audience, perhaps. Just want to I, check that everyone can see. OK, all I can see is my, I can't see myself. I, can I just think it's fine. Myself. I think it might be a personal setting. OK, now. OK, you're good to go. Sorry to interrupt now. Oh, good. No, no problem, Shannon. Thank you. Um, and to the rear, um, hopefully you can see the cursor moving. This is the forestall field. So that's the extent of our property ownership uh, at Small Hive. So Small Hive is probably most uh, well known as the home of uh, Ellen Terry, who is a famous Victorian actress. And you can see her on the left there in her most famous outfit, uh, painted by John Singer Sargent in the beetle wing dress uh, as Lady Macbeth. The second thing that Small Hive is uh, known for is as a site of royal shipbuilding. Uh, another phrase you have to say quite carefully, actually. Um, so we know that from the early decades of the 15th century through to the middle part of the 16th century, there was uh, uh, ships being built for the kings. Uh, so we know Henry V built ships there, Henry VII built ships just downstream at Reading Street, and Henry VIII built ships as well. So we're looking at an image there from the Antony Roll, which is a 16th century document held in the British Library, uh, which is essentially a drawn catalogue of the, the king's ships and includes the Mary Rose. And here we're looking at the Grand Mistress, which was built at Small Hive. First archaeological excavations at Small Hythe were undertaken by none other than the Time Team in 1998. Um, here you can see them on site, um, and there's Damien Goodburn with Phil Harding uh, recreating part of a medieval ship. So this is their areas uh, that they looked at when they were coming uh, to the site. They looked at some parts off the National Trust property, but they excavated four trenches, trenches four and five, six and seven, in the Elfwick and the Forstall fields. And the hashed areas represent those parts of the site that they uh, undertook geophysical survey. So not a complete survey across all of our land, um, but a very useful survey nonetheless. So here are some images of that 1998 dig. We're basically looking at this site. Um, it's, a, it's a buried foreshore. So those of you who are familiar with intertidal archaeology, this is a site that was once tidal and is now uh, in fields. So it's quite unusual that we're looking for a foreshore in a field. And that's what we're looking at on the left-hand side. We're looking out towards the river onto some of the, those foreshore sands. And on the right-hand side of the slide, you can see at the top where Phil Harding is, is part of a brick kiln that they discovered, which overlies a, a cutting or an inlet, which is where they would have been building um, medieval ships. And here are some of their finds, which are held in the local uh, Tenterton Museum. We've got some bricks from the kiln I mentioned. We've got part of a, a, a ship or a small boat at the bottom, so part of a clinker built vessel. And on the right, these very diagnostic uh, iron artifacts, which are representative of shipbuilding. So we have diamond shaped roves, that's R O V E S, uh, which are the, the washers essentially through which you clench the planks of your ship together. So you drive the nail through, you attach the washer, the rove onto the end, and then you bend the nail over and clip it off. And that's what holds this, the structure of the vessel together. And here's a screenshot uh, from the program showing their suggested reconstruction of this medieval shipyard site. So um, it's, it's not a formal uh, shipyard as we would know them now with docks uh, and dry docks and mud docks and things like that. It's a much more informal process on the shore 
Um, and we we understand from the artifacts that they're not just doing building there, they're also doing ship repair and ship breaking. And we'll go on to have a quick look at why we know that. So following on from that, in 2005, we had a historic landscape survey commissioned by, uh, by the National Trust from Archaeology Southeast, starting to sort of tease out those wider landscape details and starting to phase them. So looking at the development of the landscape through time. So as the river contracted and silted up and navigation was no longer possible for large vessels up that northern branch of the Rother, uh, the landscape becomes much more agricultural um, and the fields are turned over to pastoral uh, use. And we also have uh, at Small High some very useful sewage treatment plant projects. Um, and I mention these because they've given us some very useful information about other aspects of the archeology span of this site. So here we see uh, a project to put the new sewage treatment works in the Elfwick, uh, sorry, the Forstall field here, with a nice section all the way across the field, intersecting with Time Team's trench. Um, and this is where we have our first evidence for Roman activity at the site. Um, so in one of these pipe trenches running through here, there was a small amount of Roman ceramic building material and pottery recovered. In 2019, we were working with the Hastings and Area Archaeological Research Group to uh, complete the geophysical survey, so a magnetometry survey in Elfwick, Forstall Fields, and also in the gardens of Small Hythe Place. And it was during this survey that the team uh, from Haag also noticed more Roman material being exposed in molehills and rabbit excavations, in particularly in the Elfwick field. And here is their plot on the right hand side. You see a very busy picture there. So at the bottom, uh, the very large signal is the kiln that Time Team identified. And then moving over towards the eastern part of the field, we have this mass of activity. Uh, and we can also see field boundaries running to the north of, of the Elfwick field there. So we were really keen to follow up on that geophysical survey. And we tried to set up a project uh, in 2020, which was for obvious reasons postponed to 2021, to give people an opportunity to come and work on site with us and to do some uh, public engagement around archaeology through programming at the property. Because it was the home of Ellen Terry, we also have a working theatre, the Barn Theatre at Small Hive, so we are able to hold evening lectures and so on. That work was funded by National Trust uh, research funding and also by the Royal Archaeological Institute. And through five weeks of excavation to date, uh, we these are our research aims to so a better understanding of Roman activity, more investigation of the medieval village of Small Hive, refine our understanding of those ship uh, yard, ship building locations, and if there was any evidence for a great fire of Small Hive reported in 1514-15. And we will be on site again in uh, two and a half weeks time, I think it is, three weeks. Uh, this week, this year's season is funded by the Society of Antiquaries and the William and Edith Oldham Charitable Trust. So here is our site plan uh, to date. This has been prepared for us by Alistair Oswald of English Heritage and Kate Pollard of Middle Level. Um, and you can see our trench locations there in red with time teams trenches outlined in orange. And with Al's uh, topographic survey and earthwork survey adding to more detail to that picture. So you can see that the earthworks uh, define the uh, cuttings. We've got a large clay pit in the middle, which is most likely the source for the brick kiln um, and the trenches across the landscape. So starting with the Romans, we did not set out to look <laughs> for Romans, but we have most certainly found them. What we have is a small Roman settlement that dates uh, in occupation from the early part of the first century AD and possibly pushing back uh, earlier than that. We have uh, cut features, pits, ditches and so on. We have some evidence for timber uh, buildings in the terms of beam slots. We have uh, to date over 60 kilograms of Roman pottery recorded from the site, uh, included imported materials such as the Samian ware with the potter's stamp that you can see on the right there. Um, lovely decorated sherds as well, um, largely unabraded, so we think the field has not been ploughed uh, very often. 
um, and some very large pieces as well um, that have been able to be excavated and partially reassembled. Um, so you can visit the models of those uh, artifacts on our Sketchfab site. Also, Classis Britannica tile, so evidence for the Roman fleet um, active in the area using the waterway in the same way it was used in the medieval period, although no evidence for shipbuilding up till now for the Roman period. Um, and we can cast our minds back to the 1940s and Ivan Margri's work looking at Roman routeways uh, across this landscape and gives you a good idea of the, the shallow sea or emerging land that lies to our east. So moving on uh, to the later periods and just uh, coming back to our uh, site plan, I also just wanted to touch base with another sewage treatment plant project, which also returned a lot of evidence for uh, Roman archaeology. And in this instance, a dump layer that seems to uh, represent the remains of a masonry building with a hypercourse tiles coming out as well, uh, so possibly a heated structure. For the medieval period, we, de we have definite structures. So we have this medieval uh, stretch of wall built in chalk, which is unusual for the area, to the uh, line just to the west of Small Hythe Road. Um, and there is a later building lying just to the south of it, uh, 17th or 18th century date. The, the, the chalk wall is probably 15th, 16th century in date. We have undertaken further geophysical survey, uh, so some resistivity survey, also some ground penetrating radar survey by the Wielden Archaeology Group. And again, the area to just to the west of the road is looking extremely promising for this year. So these are our building remains that we've already excavated. And we're particularly interested in this uh, semicircular building with some uh, projecting wings that are coming off the side here. Um, and of course, now we can also make use of the LIDAR so we can see very clearly uh, the shapes of the uh, inlets or cuttings lying next to the river. We've re-excavated Time Team's Trench, uh, so we've gone through and found the bottom of the kiln. We've also excavated down onto the foreshore where we see we've got uh, trample layers at the top, so to create a, a drier surface to walk on. But really, it's been the metal detecting that has proved uh, most helpful in terms of helping to refine our understanding uh, of the shipyards. This is James Ward, uh, Thames Mudlarker, who's been a key member of our team since the beginning. And on the left hand side, you can see some unused roads. So roads that are in a strip and haven't yet been broken up to use in a ship. Last year, we uh, surveyed a sample area of the Elfwick field, over 120 fine spots recorded, almost all ferrous artifacts and almost all of them related to shipbuilding. So more uh, unused roads on the left and in the centre and used roads on the right. So showing that we have not only building and manufacture, but also repair and breaking. Um, we've been back in the spring of this year in some uh, very wet weather to sort of test those assumptions that we made. Uh, this is the spread from 2022, so all of those fine spots located in the Elfwick and the Forstall fields. Subsequent to that, as I mentioned, we've, uh, we've done a lot more detecting. All of those red and yellow flags are ferrous signals, um, so we have them in the Elfwick field, in the Forstall field, on the tennis court and in the area just to the south of the Barn Theatre. Over four and a half uh, thousand fine spots recorded, almost all of them ferrous. We've dug two sample transects, so a further 60 fine spots excavated, and they were almost entirely nails and roads and nails and roads and nails and roads. Uh, these are the areas that we have so far uh, detected uh, with a small team during the spring, and it's going to help us to refine uh, where we put our trenches uh, in the next few weeks. So we're all very, very excited uh, to be going back to Small Hive for a third season of excavation. Um, and I'd like to say a huge thank you to an amazing team who've been working on this project um, and how excited we are to be heading back again into the field soon. Thank you. Oh, that's amazing, Nat. That's incredible to see. Um... I, I just want to say one thing really quickly, a, a sensible comment. There's a few people who are just having a little bit of trouble with uh, internet sound and images. I don't think it's on our side. I'm sorry, it might be sort of various people's internet connection. This is being recorded and it will go on the Archaeology UK YouTube channel in the next couple of days. So um, apologies if anybody is dropping out and can't hear anything, uh, it will all be available. Um, I want to also congratulate Nat on not using the word pandemic 
in uh, discussing 2020 and saying, you know, skirting around that. I think that's, I mean, we're still doing it three years on, but well done. I'm going to say it. You didn't, but well done. <laughs> we don't mention um, the event, Shannon. You know we, don't, we, we don't, don't mention it. The, the year that shall not be discussed. Um, but no, it's, it's incredible. You, you did that very well. Um, and also, I just want to say that uh, whilst... Whilst I know that Nat was not disappointed to find Roman activity, I know that your heart was completely set on trying to find these medieval shipbuilding sites. And obviously the evidence is there in the, in the metalwork, um, but the results were surprising. And I just find it as a prehistorian, and I've learned to be very interested in much later stuff working with the National Trust. And these guys are very inspiring to listen to, but you're one of the few people to be disappointed to find things that are 1500 years earlier than what you were looking for. So um, I'm converted now. I'm loving you're the You're converted. She loves I'm the Roman, all Roman so. from here on in. <laughs> That's it. That's what happens. Um, wonderful. Thank you, Nat. That's incredible. And I really, really hope that I can get out. I'm holidaying in Kent in August. So Yay. I'm hoping that I can come out with the kids um, and not get in your way. Uh, lovely. Well Thank you. So we are now going to go up north up north mark uh to the northeast it's grand up north grand up north to move into a much later period uh and so mark is going to talk us through some of the work that he's been doing at benenborough hall good evening everybody my name is mark newman and i'm the archaeological consultant on the east side of our north region uh one of the properties i look after there is benenborough hall um as shannon has trailed and I was delighted when I discovered that the theme of the festival this year was archaeology and creativity, because the project I'm going to talk to you about couldn't have been better made to work underneath that title. It's thoroughly archaeological in character, uh, but also it's about the largest scale creativity that we in a British society engage in, creation of gardens and designed landscapes. And it was super thrilling to see that there is actually a gardening trowel in the, in the uh, little jollies advertising the festival this year so that's a perfect fit um, and it is deliberate that we're talking about not one garden but several hence Benningborough's uh, rediscovered uh, which is our thing now. Um, it's also a super relevant project to talk to in this context because I am stealing the thunder of the remarkable Roads to the Past group, who are a community archaeology group from Thornton the Street, a little bit further north from Benningborough, who have actually been doing all the hard work here. And I just sworn in and take the credit in, in sessions like this. But they have been truly amazing um, with all the work that they've done and that is currently ongoing. But let's get into the story. So, Benningborough is about eight miles to the northwest of the city of York. Uh, sitting beside the River Ouse at its confluence with the River Nid, as you can see on the map here. For many people, for a long time, visiting Ben, and including the senior management of the National Trust, Benningborough was about a nice uh, Georgian mansion. Um, and to be more precise, about a very nice staircase inside a Georgian mansion, and the rest of the stuff sort of came with it. Uh, and the, the, the came with it that we're talking about is a 300 acre park here and as you can see we're looking at the ooze flowing through here with the need trickling in from the side. Benningborough at the heart of things but actually quite a lot else going on in the surrounding landscape starting with a little Roman villa uh, beside the river then with a thick layer of medieval archaeology because this site was owned by St Leonard's Hospital in York before you get into the gentry age um, and the stuff that's going to be our main theme uh, tonight. Benningborough Ah, if I keep pressing the wrong button, that's not going to go down. There we go. So at the dissolution, uh, the former possessions of St. Leonard's Hospital went into private hands. And by the 1550s, Benningborough had been taken over by this chap, Ralph Belcher, um, who made Bren Benningborough his principal seat and constructed a house, well, somewhere on the property, probably uh, taking over the Grange buildings and expanding them. He became a figure of some national note and involved in law and financial world in Tudor England. Uh, the best guide we have to where he lived is this sort of Gothic script, Here Be Dragons, site of the old hall or manor house of Benningborough, just out to the uh, southeast of the present wall garden and ha ha around the 18th century mansion. Um, the various squiggle lines are on here, have a huge story behind them, uh, but we think that there is a Tudor period garden with water features, rectilinear structures in the landscape emanating out from this building, including the garden, which is going to be a key part of the story in a moment. 
the next layer of Benningbrus comes in the 17th century when the sort of garden wars takes place. So successive generations of, of Abouchers consolidate their position, the members of parliament, one of them even has the fun of being one of the people who signed Charles I's death warrant. Um, so there's lots of drama going on in this landscape, but there's house wars going on uh, across the river from Benningborough at Nunmonkton Hall, and more particularly the Slingsby family, also the members of Parliament, uh, with their with their house at Red House, with sort of competitive gardening being flashed across the waters at each other, um, and a quite interesting and unusual development uh, of sort of detached parklands. So Red House has its own ornamented park here and Benningborough has one detached outside the present National Trust boundaries uh, over here. So quite a, a singular and distinctive um, exploration of new gardening ideas emerging through the 17th century. And I think there was a major investment in the gardens in Benningborough in the last years of the 17th century. Um, and then when uh, John Boucher went on uh, grand tour to Europe, he brought back Italian ideas about architecture, wanted to create a new mansion. I think everybody said, and how much did we spend on that garden? Um, well, I'll tell you what, we'll slot the mansion in to fit the pre-existing garden. And this is the earliest depiction of that garden by this wonderful chap on the right, Samuel Buck. He only bothers drawing half a scene like this because we all know gardens are symmetrical, right? So you only have to draw one half of it um, and the other half be reflected if he ever produces a completed engraving that he didn't. Now, when I started working at Benningborough over 30 years ago, this was taken to be a sort of artist's impression of a garden that never was, because there isn't a garden like that there. That stands to reason. But at the bottom of his drawing, Buck has just done a series of parallel lines and squiggly writing says, a fine channel. So the story moved forward another chapter in 1989 when Anthony Crawshaw took an aerial photograph of the site and here parched out uh, off to the south of the hall, very good evidence that the fine channel that was only an artist's impression has actually left the archaeology behind. So that, that had our eyes fixed on this site. The course of a decade or decade and a half um, was filled with uh, getting an earthwork survey, working with uh, English heritage here. What one of the surveyors described, described as the subtlest earthworks you've ever come across because they're hardly there. Uh, but they did their best job to squeeze this out of it. Uh, we, we augmented our understanding of the site with geophysical survey working with the University of Bradford, work funded by Natural England through their Historic Parks programme. Um, and then uh, in 2015, open source, open source LIDAR came along and we all realised we've been wasting our time for 20 years because the LIDAR was an awful lot better. So here we have the fine channel again and a series of little ponds along the outside of it and these wonderful compartments with their saltair crosses, losing some detail here inside the 18th century, ha-ha, uh, for the redesigned gardens that Georgians were going to visit on top of this sequence of treasures. So the garden we know is there, but we can't see it very regularly. Um, and in July 2021, the wonderful uh, Great British Dig team came and visited Benningborough uh, and pushed our understanding of the site further forward. So I'll see your time to Nat and I'll raise you a few Dennis. Um, they investigated out on the north side of the site <clears throat> and we discovered some previously unknown water features, did some geophysics uh, to the south of the mansion and some auguring out across the gardens that we've been seeing with the LIDAR, but most saliently looked at this area here to the east of the house uh, where we are creating a new, we're going to create a new garden. Benningborough is going to have a series of four new gardens designed by Andy Sturgeon, who is a Chelsea Flower Show gold medal winner uh, and, uh, and garden designer of, of considerable distinction. Uh, we've already put in the first one in 2019 here, the gazebo garden. The second is the Mediterranean garden that is called, and it's going to be a garden constructed around ideas of Mediterranean climate and how climate change is going to affect what's possible in an English garden. But its most characterizing feature is it's going to have five uh, straight walls here dividing the space up, built from York stone. Those will require foundationing. So we thought we would investigate two of the foundation trenches to see if there was any significant archaeology lurking. So the two here. And 
I've had my eye on this area of the site because it's got a funny little slope running up it and I've always thought that really doesn't look terribly natural to me and everybody's looked at me a bit funny and suggested that I'll have a bit more water with my lunch um, <clears throat> but I thought it was worth a punt. Uh, we also knew that this area had been a rose garden in the Edwardian period, uh, the yellow lines here are the Ordnance Survey's depiction of the outside of that, they, they weren't creating a coffin shaped garden much though it looks like it it all takes its sense from the geometry of the hall and its surrounding areas and then the contrasting geometry of the late 18th century walled gardens so it's not quite as macabre as it appears on first glimpse and what the great british dig people found well we dug our lovely foundation french and i sat on the edge of it with chris scott who was leading uh, the excavation work and said, is, am I actually looking at natural anywhere here? And the penny dropped that we weren't. Uh, the deepest excavations were down to about one metre 30, no sign of natural, but what we did have was this fabulous brick wall. And this is at the bottom of the slope rather than the top. It went down to at least one metre 20 below present ground surface and is 60 centimetres wide. And given that Georgians don't always bother with foundations, this was something pretty chunky. And our interpretation of it is that it is a retaining wall for some substantial physical structure, which has been removed by uh, later gardening uh, on the site. There's something really chunky going on here. And just as a nice little added bit in the last moments of the dig, we got these two rather charming pieces of decorative plasterwork, possibly from a garden building not far removed from this location. Since 21, we've gone further which is really where Roads to the Past have stepped in and have been brilliant. Uh, they have been running the show out there. I give it, uh, I sort of help them decide where it is that we're taking the project and bring in the things that the trust wants to achieve, but they have been completely self-motivating, training people who've not been involved in the archaeology before. They've so far dug 47 trial pits, and seven larger excavations, and we've just started work on an eighth that you'll see in a moment. Our friends from Bradford University have been back and have used ground penetrating radar and magnetometry uh, and Mason Clark contractors also did some GPR for us. So we now have this complicated uh, plot of the anomalies coming through in the radar. This is our original uh, retaining wall, which we can now see actually kinks in and out in a crinkle chemical fashion. Um, and with an eye of faith, you might think if this wall lines up with the one that we're looking at. And are those crinkle crankles actually in the sketch? Perhaps they are, perhaps not. But we now know that this wall returns and this goes on and proceeds outside the ha ha to join up with the archaeology that we've seen in the fields. And there are a series of uh, perpendicular features uh, lying to the outside, hinting at the gardens that must have existed the north of this formal garden and to the south, uh, sorry, and to the east. Um, <clears throat> as I say, residents of the past have, have been doing all the, uh, the uh, work out on site. This is a view of uh, the tr a trench. I will just point out for you where it is. So it's located up here. And the next one I'm going to show you is located down over here, but let's talk about this one first. So we're now one meter 20 down, and once again, natural is proving elusive. These are all landscaping and construction layers um, <clears throat> from a raised platform for a formal garden that kind of then sloped down towards the ewes. So it was displayed out before you as you approached the house, having brought, uh, arrived by boat uh, down the river. And there are considerable quantities of building materials, mainly uh, brick and tile, but also plaster and some uh, dressed stonework coming out of this area. This trench was really about establishing whether or not there was a direct trace of the building. We don't think there is. We think that this is all being used for landscaping purposes, but it contains some rather lovely stuff. So once again, archaeology and creativity, this is looking for ancient gardens before we build a new garden. And here the artifacts do gardens for you as well. Um, it's been a, a you know, absolutely super little piece of excavation. And we push on. So trench eight, the one I said we would come to in a moment, is actively being excavated for Festival of British Archaeology. And we have six open days. Um, and I'd love to say that people come and, and, and respectfully observe 
the magnificent excavations that are being done by, by roads in the past, but actually they have to spend most of their time talking to people who are fascinated to, to see what we're looking for. We're trying to establish the physical uh, manifestation of what's coming through in the radar, proving uh, what was there. All the other holes are pieces of ground that are going to be disturbed when we build the new garden starting in September. This one's a little bit more of an indulgence because we realise this archaeology was so significant, but we weren't going to be able to investigate it for the next hundred years while Andy's garden is what's on the surface. So we're having a look before that happens. So, of course, it's a garden as well as beautiful uh, pictures of flowers and leaves in the plasterwork, plenty of flower pots, some of which join up nicely, but not as nice as your Roman stuff, I, I will admit. <clears throat> but I did want to bring it entirely up to date. So this was opening the, the trench last week. And uh, this is what they have found as of Monday. So we're looking uh, north across the site here. This is the original retaining wall, and we have got uh, a return from it spot on where the radar said it was going to be. There are some other things which look pretty chunky on the radar plot that we haven't found yet, but we're still looking. Um, and you might just be able to see extending north from it, the bricks, the next set of bricks are actually laid without mortaring on their sides. And I think that they're a foundation uh, for the continuation of that north-south wall. Um, what we're going to look at next is whether that is the same foundation under here, or it's a change in style because this wasn't engineered to retain as great a height of material as the chunkier walls over here. We can see on the, the, the radar plot, these go down to about one meter 40, one meter 50 below current surface, but they were bang on uh, 80 centimeters down, which is where the radar said that they would be. So our creativity and archeology span join together beautifully in this little story. I think where we'd like to take it is to be able to produce a view like this of Benningborough and all the gardens that surrounded it on each side. We're not quite there yet, I think we're getting an awful lot closer through the course of this project. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. That was incredible. Um, I, I do want to say something serious, but first I'm just going to check in with you because obviously as a prehistorian, this is about five and a half thousand years after the sort of stuff that I'm particularly interested in, but um, is crinkle crankles an architectural term or? It's a term that you get in landscaping. It's most commonly, uh, it's most commonly a sinuous curve and you can do it in planting, but you do also sometimes get brick walls that do it. So you have differential heat and cool at different points along a garden wall. Now, you see, I asked in jest and he gave me a serious answer. So I thought <laughs> perhaps it was one of those off the cuff kind of terms. Um, and I'm still, I'm still with your characterization of everything we do, uh, Shannon, as post interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Don't tell everyone that I say that. Um, yeah, but that to me, every, everything past the Iron Age is post interesting. That's not true. It's all amazing. Um, but I think one of the things that I've really come to appreciate in the National Trust and, and that your project here really, really highlights, Mark, is there is that real sweet spot. I think in some of the places that we look after, um, and it is in that sort of late medieval, post medieval period, where you can bring together documents, drawings, LIDAR, earthworks, parch marks now, geophysics, you know, so the underground, the above ground, the documents, all of that stuff can come together, coupled with the odd uh, archaeological hunch, which I love, you know, you observe sort of an area that you suspected something, you tested it, and you're right, and there's nothing more satisfying as an archaeologist than when you suspect something and you get proven right. Um, but yeah, but I think it just really celebrates that sort of period, <clears throat> really celebrates the fact that you can bring together all this kind of research into one incredible project and it's just you know there are bits for everyone in that um i think it's really interesting and i think before we move on to gary i say gary if you're worried about this kind of one-upmanship around time team and great british dig and all of this you've probably got i would say i know you're going to focus on particular parts of changing talk but in terms of scale changing talk is massive isn't it so yeah if, it's all if about you want to do quantity, quantity not quality it's quantity, all about quantity. Yeah. that's right that's right that's what counts um anyway so i will pass over to gary now who's going to give you and i'm really interested to see how you summarize this because there's a massive amount of work and information to yeah, going I, on in changing talk i'm interested to see how i'm going to do it as well so excellent thanks gary thanks mark okay is that showing up for everyone all right Yep, I see it, I hear you. Great, so my name's Gary Webster and I'm the Heritage Officer for the Changing Chalk Partnership. So um, I've been with the partnership for about a year now. I'm employed by the National Trust. Um, and 
I'll be talking about this evening what is changing chalk and what we're kind of aiming to do and how we're aiming to do that. So the National Trust is the lead partner in the Changing Chalk Partnership, uh, alongside lots of the, uh, the, the people that you can see on the screen there, Brighton Hove City Council, Sussex Wildlife Trust, uh, South Downs National Park Authority, Natural England, the Living Coast, Lewis Railway Land. There's lots and lots of partners and uh, there's, there's kind of lots of disciplines covered. So it's been a nice kind of learning experience being part of Change of Chalk, being able to dive into all these different uh, disciplines that are covered. And I kind of fancy myself as a, a slight ecologist now, having learned a few different um, butterfly species during my, uh, my tenure here. So Changing Chalk is uh, made possible with a National uh, Heritage Lottery Fund. Uh, the People's Postcode Lottery um, and the Limbury Trust and of course the, the people who play those lotteries as well. So I'll get some uh, notes in there about how it's funded. So the entire purpose of the Changing Chalk Partnership, the real core theme is to protect and preserve uh, the chalk grassland. So chalk grassland is a uh, uh, internationally important habitat, a rare habitat and one which I'm um, uh, we do have most of um, in the south of England, um, anywhere in the world, um, but unfortunately we have lost about 80% of it since the Second World War um, due to kind of urbanisation and kind of food production pressures and things like that. Um, so the yellow parts of the map or the orange parts of the map here will show you with the chalk grassland that's remaining in the Changing Chalk area. Uh, this is the Changing Chalk area, you can see Eastbourne to the east over here, Brighton over here, and it includes Lewis, New Haven, uh, Peace Haven. So it includes the urban areas as well. So you might notice here that the, um, the survival of the chalk grassland is on, on particularly steep, uh, steep parts of the, the South Downs. So these are kind of on scarp slopes and stuff like that. Um, and generally you can say the reason that it survived in these areas is because you cannot drag a plow over it because it's just too, it's just on such a steep kind of uh, slope. So why is this kind of habitat important? Well, it's known as a kind of uh, a, a tropical rainforest in miniature because you can get such a wide amount of species in such a small um, area, like a square meter, you can have upwards of 40 different uh, plant species. And it really is a kind of, um, unique mosaic of, of uh, habitat um, and, and ecological diversity and something that is really worth uh, saving and not only saving but restoring and, and joining together which is what the partnership is hoping to do. Uh, a really good example of why this is such a kind of special habitat is uh, in what is often regarded as the, the jewel of the uh, Sussex, the Adonis blue uh, butterfly um, some of you might have recognised recognised that. I've never actually seen one myself, much to my shame. Only the common blues for me. Uh, but it really is a great example of what, it, you know, this kind of integrated e ecosystem. Um, so, uh, the, for example, the sheep graze the um, chalk grassland, which allows the horseshoe vetch to grow. The horseshoe vetch is the only food plant for the uh, Donis blue. So it has to have this plant to exist. Um, the Adonis blue uh, feeds on this plant and uh, it, it can lay its eggs. Uh, its eggs are, when they eventually turn into caterpillars, are protected by yellow meadow ants who, who, who suck the uh, honeydew, which comes from the back of the caterpillar, and they basically keep it alive. They look after it and they go as far as to bury it at night so it doesn't come to harm. So this is just like a very small sh snapshot of a very integrated ecology involving loads and loads of different species. And they all start with that kind of chalk grassland. So the partnership is aiming to uh, do this through three different themes. Uh, one of them pretty much speaks for itself, for ch restoring chalkland biodiversity. That's, there's a few different projects uh, involved there, inc including uh, grazing and uh, Kind of working on work, local wildlife sites to understand just how much we've got and the condition it's in. Uh, connecting downs and towns 
there's a lot of this is about um, actually getting people out onto the downs who maybe have never experienced down the landscape before. And you'd be really surprised to see how many people have never been out on the downs before, even if they live in Brighton or Eastbourne. There's, uh, yeah, there's a lot of people who even 18, 19 have never been up there. So this is something that's really important. It's getting people up there so they can feel the benefits, the mental health benefits, the physical benefits of being out in this landscape in the fresh air. And there's also, of course, uh, Hearts and Histories of the Downs, which is the uh, things that I'm most involved with. Uh, I lead on Monument Mentors, Monument Mentors and Downs from Above, which I'll be discussing a bit later. Um, and there's also the Big Dig, which I'll rough, rough, uh, briefly come on to. So quickly, where did the Downs come from? Well, it was originally, you could think of it as one giant fossil. It's, it's formed of trillions of skeletons from single celled organisms that over a hundred million years, a hundred million years ago have, have rested on the, in the sea and died. And they're kind of the coccoliths, the small skeletal plates that you can see on the screen there um, have fallen to the, to the, the, the uh, ocean floor and they've basically built up. Um, and that's, this is where the chalks come from. Uh, tectonic activity 55 million years ago has pushed the plates of Europe and uh, Africa together. Um, and that has, very slowly started to create the downs um, as well as the Alps. Um, so 50, uh, 10 to 15 centimetres a year movement over the course of 50, 55 million years has given us this, this um, landscape. So it would originally have been effectively a giant chalk dome uh, that, have, that would have gone straight from the South Downs all the way to the, the North Downs. Um, which has, which I imagine would have been quite a sight to behold, but unfortunately in the interim 55 million years, it has uh, weathered away in the middle. So we're left with the South Downs as we see them now and the, um, and the, the Weald to the north, uh, which is a very different, a uh, very different landscape. Because of course, in the Weald we have, um, which is the kind of, the, this bit here, in the Weald we have heavy clays, whereas on the South and North Downs we have soils, uh, thin soils over chalk, so they don't retain water uh, very well at all, and it goes straight through to the kind of aquifers below. Uh, however, in the weald, water will sit for a very long time, so it's two, it creates two different um, two different kind of top landscapes in a very close proximity. Um, also, the weald uh, has been called a, the, a, a man's farming work. It's a, a lot more effort is involved in in kind of cultivation and stuff like that because it's uh, such a kind of waterlogged environment and this was a few years ago it's probably should change since then but so um no tender hearted garden crowns no bosom wooden woods adorn are blunt bow-headed well back downs but gnarled and rhythm thorn their slopes were chasing shadow skim and through the gaps revealed belt upon belt the wooded dim blue goodness of the wield so uh it's been a really good inspiration for uh, lots of kind of artists and poets and stuff like that. And I mean, you can see why absolutely fantastic landscape, one that I'm pleased to work in. However, it didn't come out like this uh, through the course of 55 million years. It is very much a man-made landscape. And what do I mean by this? Well, it contains something which is uh, sought after um, and has been used in shaping it. It contains flint, flint used to forge the tools well not forge the tools you used in tool production and um and basically deforested the entire area you know six thousand seven thousand years ago uh they, they really would have started going going hard at the on the defraud deforestation of the of the south downs and it would have been a very very different landscape uh so from the the image on the right here is just an, a representation of a kind of flint mine uh, this is from that's a representation of one at Grimes Graves, I think. Uh, so we do have flint mines in the Chasey Chalk area, um, such as those found at. Uh, well, actually, this is an image just outside the Chasey Chalk area, but it's just a good representation. Um, this is at Sisbury uh, Ring, but we do have uh, ones inside the Chasey Chalk area too, like at uh, Windover Hill and uh, round about there. Um, so this was extracted and was used effectively to deforest the area among other things, as traded as well. Um, you do get different types of flint that you sometimes see kind of an orangey flint that comes out uh, on the um, on the downland, but this is coming from a different geological deposit. This is coming from a clay with flints um, 
formation and it's not as good to work with and it wasn't as prized as tools the kind of black flint that you get from the chalk was really was really really appreciated so uh yeah 4000 bc they these flint mines kind of date from and then of course the hill fort that sits on top of it was from uh probably about 250 bc so that's the kind of i uh Going right back then, what, what were they doing up here in this landscape? Well, it's always been a landscape which has uh, they've they've really liked to enjoy and and build these kind of monuments with with purpose, and that's been something that we can see throughout throughout the entire series of the um, you know the last six thousand years. They use these areas, they reuse them, they do different things in there. So here we can see uh, Butts Brow, which is a Neolithic causeway enclosure. Uh, which is dated to roughly 3600 uh, BC. Um, and you can see the kind of in the lidar, just the kind of outer bank here. Uh, this is a later plantation from about 1900, but here we can see a, a plan. So this was found relatively recently, um, just before the Changing Chalk uh, project. And there's been some work on it, and there's been more recent work. Um, as part of the Changing Chalk project to, to understand it a bit better. What's really fascinating about this is that it's so close to another uh, Neolithic causeway enclosure just the north called Coombe Hill, and it's rare to get two so close together. So this was, uh, as part of the big dig, there was a community excavation here, which really helped us to kind of further our understanding, and there's going to be more information coming out about, uh, about our findings there. But we don't really know what they were doing in these kind of places because it's not clear that they were... Um, living up there it's not clear that they were feasting up there there's not real evidence of what it was they were doing so it, it held some significance we just can't be sure what it was it could be more of a kind of monumental look at me kind of thing and that is definitely something that we see um ca carrying on throughout the throughout, throughout the history of the landscape so in the bronze age the um escarpments the the top of the downs used to create these um, these barrows, effectively funerary monument monuments. There's loads of them up there. It's really, really rich, full of these kind of monuments, and it's something that uh, that you you see a lot of. I've been out with a lot of people recently who uh, w through changing chalk, and you come out, you talked about these things, you're telling people what they are. And they're, they're like, oh, I didn't realise that's what it was. I had no idea that's what that lump and bump was. I thought it was just uh, just something that you, you know, just a natural thing. So it's really good to get this kind of feedback that people are just learning what these things are for the first time. And this is one thing I'm really keen to press with Changing Chalk is introducing people to these new ideas. So this, you've got to think at the time when this was first created, uh, kind of, you know, between the Bronze Age, um, it would have been a kind of bright white, chalk dome uh so you know would people have gone up there and kept the grass off it to keep it visible keep it as a, a monument you can see for miles and miles um would it have been a reference point in the landscape um yeah we don't know um but the you get all sorts of different evidence from these uh these features of, of how they were used uh different burial practices um, underneath sometimes wooden stakes stones uh, sometimes they were reused again to bury other people. Um, you can see another one here. So this one's obviously been excavated previously in the middle uh, during the kind of kind of 18, 1900s antiquarians coming in, digging out what they can from the middle here. It's, just, it's funny because in a way it kind of resembles the south and north downs there, the chalk with the, the middle taken out, um, which someone pointed out to me when I, after I just described the creation. But um, also got obviously the great um, hill fort, Devil's Dyke, um, giant univ uh, univallet hill fort that into the Iron Age, situated on a chalk spur, which forms part of the Sussex Downs. But the ditches would have been significantly bigger. There would have been palisades. There would have been, you know, a, a, a true monument. Obviously, they're using lots of the natural geology of the kind of Devil's Dyke here um, to 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 form part of the to form part of the monument. This was also reused quite extensively in the Victorian period when it was basically a, a kind of large theme park, effectively. There was a funicular which came up here, up the side, so people from uh, Falking down here could get up here easier. There was a, an, a cable way, like a cable car that stretched across the dike here. 
there was carousels, there was all sorts of, of pleasure grounds on this land. So it's absolutely fascinating to think it's been reused in such a way. And now obviously scaled right back uh, and gone back to how more how it would have been 2000 years ago. So Ed Burton, uh, Mott and Bailey uh, Castle. So this would have been created just soon after the, the 1066. Um, although many were occupied for kind of a short period of time, uh, after the kind of 13th centuries, they were um, superseded by other types of, of kind of castles and stuff. So this, again, there's some speculation that this is actually a, a reuse of a barrow uh, because it does look like it could be that. And in fact, it has been excavated. Someone's excavated the middle thinking it was a barrow trying to find, uh, trying to find the grave goods within. But there's no evidence of that. So what am I doing? I'm running two projects, one of which is Monument Mentors. Uh, Monument Mentors seeks to engage people um, that, that uh, with these features, with these barrows, with these Neolithic causeway enclosures, so that they can actually take a hand in caring for it and, by, and um, looking out for signs of, of problems such as um, burrowing, burrowing animals, over scrubbing, um, anything that might need attention, a lot of vandalism too, unfortunately. Um, and really allow people to take ownership of their past. So I do kind of quite frequent walks out where we go and visit these monuments and kind of um, do these condition surveys. Um, I'm also doing the Downs From Above, Above project, uh, which is uh, where lots of um, archaeology has been mapped using aerial photos and LIDAR surveys, 190 square kilometres, in fact, uh, all of this area here, basically filling in between these two red blocks, which have already been done in other mapping projects. We've got all the mapping data from inside, and that is what it looks like. Um, this is kind of the portal that we're going to be using to access this data. And this is going to give us uh, the opportunity to go out and visit lots of newly found um, earthworks and sites with basically more fidelity than they've had before. Um, really exciting, and it's going to be launching very soon, so keep an eye out for that. Um, we're going to be doing some visits out to a few of the, well, many of the sites that, that have been uh, found. So, so that's something to really look forward to. Examples of which, so a, a Barrow Cemetery, effectively, uh, which is thought to be part of a golf course, because there's a golf course around here, or maybe something to do with some previous tank training from um, World War II. But after doing this, this survey, this um, aerial mapping project for Changing Chalk, they found that actually it looks like it's a, a whole new barrow, uh, barrow cemetery. And I did actually go out there with a bunch of NEETs, which is people that are not in education, employment or training. Uh, we took a GPS unit with the data and we were able to locate these barrows on the ground and see what they actually look like. Um, really, really interesting. And again, this is a chance to engage some aspect, uh, some people in communities such as the NEETs that maybe we wouldn't have opportunity to do something like this. This is what the kind of changing chalk's all about. Uh, so yeah, this is the this is the kind of data, the the the, the barrows as they as they exist on the kind of uh, down from above data. So something that I'm I'm really looking forward to getting out and about with people. Um well, I've gone over. Sorry about that. So um if you would uh, like to take part if you're local, I know Shannon was really pleased to see people that were in America and stuff and that is great. But if you're local and you want to get, get involved, if you're in the Change of Chalk area or nearby, uh, you can give me an email and 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 come out with me and, and get involved. There's also uh, training uh, being offered as well in, in various things. We've got geophysics training. There's going to be some excavation training. There's all sorts of things. So, um, yeah, if you if you've got any questions, you can email me or ask me shortly. Thank you very much. Thank you, Gary. That's incredible. And um, you, you got some kudos in the chat. I'm assuming it's a plant, one of your friends or something uh, saying, you know, how great you are and what an amazing job. But but genuinely, you know, your passion about this is it really, really does come through. But I think what's really, really nice for everybody to hear is the specific projects that um, that are going on at, at properties. We really, really focus down on sort of the archaeology and the, and the history of those places. But what you're dealing with here, and you sort of touched upon it at the beginning, sort of the ecology and all the nature conservation work that goes on. Um, I think for a lot of people possibly listening, this is, you know, this is obvious to a lot of people. But um, as Gary kind of suggested, that we have no natural, truly natural places in the UK. Everything is a kind of, it's a, it's a combination of thousands of years of human activity. And, yeah. and we kind of, we can forget that quite a lot. So this project is really taking 
all of the conservation needs for for natural environment for historic environment and all things sort of cultural heritage into play and trying to bring people along that that journey and um and something obviously that the national trust is very passionate about and one of the founding members of the National Trust believed that all these places should be available. People needed space, they needed quiet, they needed um, green, they needed beauty. So all of these things which form the basis of what the National Trust stands for, you know, the Changing Chalk really is bringing all that together. Um, and yeah. it really is just an incredible piece of work. Um, it, it is. It's also worth worth mentioning, I forgot to, to mention the thing, but this isn't something that you could you could like rewild to this isn't this isn't a landscape that you can just say oh we'll leave it and it will go back to how it was because yeah. it it wasn't like that this is something that's come a, come about you know in the last six thousand years and is a man-made thing but it has yeah. to be cur- carry on being curated by man, uh, man as well yeah and that and that's it it you know all of our places everything we do from the small scale right up to things like this which which taken a vast quantity of the the south downs um is all balancing sort of the nature conservation as well as the 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 conservation and preservation of our heritage as well so um yeah i mean this just highlights in in a really big scale highlights what we do day in day out um that's why the archaeologists i think in the national trust are really special group of people because they have to work in that kind of um holistic way um which is quite different from a lot of other sort of archaeological roles um I, I won't make any jokes on well actually no I will say this you know you get points from me Gary because you talked about the Neolithic and the Bronze Age so I'm loving <laughs> that um anyway without further ado I will move on to our last speaker who is Duncan Coe now this is a very very different um presentation that you're going to be getting from Duncan Duncan is leading the growth of one of our initiatives for volunteering to monitor the condition of our archaeological assets and I'll, I'll let Duncan fill you in on some of the details but I think sort of the quantities of things that we have on our records to date uh, it's not the end of, of how many things we have. It's just, uh, you know, where we have counted up to and measured to uh, up to date is, is going to be quite um, astounding for a lot of people. So I will hand over now to Duncan. Thanks. Thanks, Shannon. Um, hopefully, uh, let me get this up and running. Hopefully everybody can see that um, the screen. Uh, fantastic. That's, I'm getting thumbs up, which is always good news. Um, I, yeah, I mean, uh, uh, Shannon says it, it's not that different from one of the previous speakers, but of course, a lot of what I'm going to be talking about is very similar to what Gary's been talking about in terms of the uh, monument mentors, um, because effectively what the Heritage and Archaeology Ranger team is, is the same concept on a bigger scale. Um, so, so uh, as as you can see, my name is Duncan Coe. I'm the project manager who's been tasked with kind of uh, developing uh, the Heart Initiative uh, and moving it forward. I should stress right from the beginning, it's not new. Uh, this is something that um, has been running within the trust, especially in the Midlands, for about the last ten years. Uh, and we have some also some very good teams in the, in the southeast. We have some excellent teams in the southwest. Um, and but what we're really trying to do is move it up a, a gear uh, and start to make it a truly national uh, uh, project, which is rolling out um, where all our relevant properties um, have teams uh, of this type. And, and if I click, hopefully that will move forward. Um, as Shannon mentioned uh, and as Gary mentioned you know our, our realization that our landscapes are entirely or you know largely man-made that that there is so much going on in our landscapes which are influenced by humankind uh, and to the to the extent to which our geologists uh, have now decided that we're in a new geological era the Anthropocene um, that you know really sort of tells you a huge story about the scope and scale of what archaeology can tell us about um, our landscapes, our history uh, and and the world around us. National Trust um, HBSMR, which is our Historic Building Sites, Monuments record, Sites and Monuments record, um, currently has about 95,000 features on our land um, of archaeological interest. And that number, as Shannon says, is growing all the time. So when I started in my post about a year ago, it was under 90,000. Um, it's 95,000 this today. Um, that includes significant parts of 11 World Heritage Sites. We've got about 1,700 scheduled monuments, uh, which become as they include multiple sites often uh, of 6,000, over 6,000 individual uh, archaeological monuments within those 
sites and uh, in the region of 5,000 listed buildings. So the National Trust is responsible for the care and maintenance of a huge um, number of uh, features of his historic and archaeological interest. Um, so what is the Heritage and Archaeology Ranger Team? Well, the Heritage and Archaeology Ranger Team is effectively a system which we are developing and, and, and have developed, which allows us to um, visit and survey and understand what's going on on the archaeological monuments that we care for. Um, and in, in effect, this is or it, it, underpinning all of this is the role of volunteers. We couldn't do this without volunteers. Volunteers are absolutely front and centre of, of, of the heart teams. Um, and effectively, what we're doing is tr attempting to recruit volunteer teams at each of our properties um, whose role will be to go out and visit the archaeological monuments within that estate to record what's going on on them, what their condition is, what threats are, are exist on them, um, and what vulnerabilities might exist on them. Um, and the idea is that we would then be able to use that information to be able to make much better and more informed decisions about what conservation actions we need to take um, and where we need to intervene, where we don't need to intervene, et cetera, et cetera. So it, it gives us a much better handle on what's going on and a much better and stronger ability to be able to take the appropriate action. But also, and very, very, very importantly, means that we get a better understanding of actually what's out there in the land, what's 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 actually happening on these estates, which we hope gives a greater sense of ownership, understanding and interest by both not just the volunteers, but also by the staff who are tasked with managing those sites and those locations. And if we take it back, and again, Shannon kind of mentioned this, if we take it right back, this is exactly what we're about. This is what the National Trust exists for. The National Trust was set up to promote the preservation of sites of historic interest. So our, the archaeology on our estate is absolutely fundamental to that. And if we don't know what's going on on those sites, we can't possibly be managing it and we can't be managing it in an appropriate way. So we're very keen. We, we see this as very, very important part of what we should be doing and what we're about as an organisation. I'm just going to run through a few examples of the kinds of issues that we might come across or the kinds of issues that we know exist out there. But before I do, I don't want to scare everyone. The large majority of the sites that we um, uh, look after are in good condition, and we know that from the existing surveys that are, that are being undertaken at, um, uh, already. So, you know, we know that the large majority of sites are in good condition and are not suffering from any, you know, possible threats or vulnerabilities. But we also know that there are lots of sites where we do have issues and where the issues do exist, and. This is very typical kind of uh, thing you'll see on an earthwork, so large earthwork site. This is Hambledon Hill in Dorset, the large Iron Age hill fort. Uh, and this is simply the product of uh, overgrazing, where animals have, have taken the soil, the, the grass off the surface. Uh, the steep banks then erode in the rain. Uh, you get more animal digging because they're licking the salts from the soil, and that just gets bigger and bigger and bigger. Uh, and if you don't intervene, that will just gradually become more and more of an issue. So um, that's that's a, a typical, it's very something you'll see very typically, especially on, uh, say, large earthwork sites. And cattle and stock can be a, a major issue. An awful lot of our land is, is farmed. Um, and, uh, you know, if you put the wrong type of stock on, if you put them at the wrong on the, the sites at the wrong time of year or in the wrong conditions, um, that can lead to problems. So understanding what's going on, understanding the, the, the agricultural regime, the type of stock that are on the site can be extremely important in understanding, um, you know, what we should or shouldn't be doing on those sites. Borrowing animals, uh, I'm sure we're, we're all aware of these sorts of issues uh, and a couple of interesting ones here. Uh, the rabbit burrows at uh, the in the town walls at Winchelsea, the medieval town walls at Winchelsea, uh, extensive uh, burrowing there that is basically slowly eroding away a scheduled monument. Um, the badgers can, can also be uh, an issue for us. Uh, here at the, on the Scotney Castle estate, um, the, the badgers are actually bringing up artifacts. And if you look closer, you can see uh, bottles uh, and glass jars and things that are coming out. Now, in this case, these are relatively recent artifacts. They're not uh, uh, 
significant in archaeological terms, but it's just an illustration of the kind of damage that uh, badgers can do if they're digging their burrows in the wrong place or their, their holts in the wrong place. Vegetation can be an issue for us. Uh, trees are wonderful things, but you know, trees do have a tendency to get blown over every now and then. Um, and when trees are blown over in certain circumstances, they can bring up with them a large root plate, which if they're on an archaeological monument can obviously cause a significant amount of damage. Uh, and on the uh, right there is a bracken. Bracken is grows from underground rhizomes. That rhizome can be quite destructive. Uh, on the surface, it just looks like nice green fluffy stuff that comes up every year. But what's happening underground is in visible but as I say can be quite damaging and here at uh, Lambert's Castle and 9H Hill Fort um, that's now been cleared um, to prevent that. Coastal erosion and of course climate change uh, and the impacts of climate change are something which is very uh, close to our hearts at the National Trust and something that we are um, very concerned about putting a lot of work into. If you look closely in the cliff edge there you'll see a dark band uh, that's actually a Bronze Age burnt mound uh, in these cliffs just below Golden Cap. Um, and here we have the uh, local uh, archaeologist and ranger with some volunteers uh, who are about to undertake a small excavation. But as you can see, we've already lost a significant amount of that burnt mound through coastal erosion with, with no recording. Um, so coastal erosion is certainly something we're concerned about. Of course, human beings themselves can bring problems. And because we uh, open our sites up to the general public, that can itself bring issues that um, we need to confront. Uh, Hadrian's Wall um, here on the right, you can see the, the damage that's done through uh, the, num the sheer number of people who are walking along this wall top there. Uh, and on the left, there's the trig point on top of Clay Hill in, in uh, Wiltshire, which is actually on top of a round barrow. Trig points traditionally are somewhere that people people flock to, um, they like to gather around them. And of course, the more people you get there, the more damage you uh, do, the more erosion that occurs. And here we've got a local, one of our local rangers uh, repairing that damage. Uh, burning, we get uh, members of the public having barbecues and, and uh, having other nefarious activities, which often involve fires. Uh, and here in, uh, in Cheshire, we've got a significant uh, bonfire that got out of control on the rampart of a hill fort um, with the obvious uh, you know uh, risk of damage to the to the underlying archaeology and to the to the archaeological features that are present uh, metal detecting we come back at Winchelsea here, um, thanks to Nat for this photograph. Um, uh, metal detecting is uh, outlawed on all National Trust property, um, but is also illegal on scheduled monuments uh, and large parts of Winchelsea are scheduled. So um, there's a sort of double crime taking place here. But unless we know it's happening, there's nothing we can do about it. So you know, we need eyes and ears on the ground. We need people to report this sort of thing to us so that we can then start to think about what actions are necessary to uh, prevent it from continuing or getting worse. Um, and of course, uh, and I think Gary mentioned graffiti. Um, uh, here's a couple of examples, one very recent one from the Peak District and a slightly older one from Alderley Edge in Cheshire. Um, and uh, you know the, these kinds of activities again you know we can't we're not necessarily always going to be able to stop them um, but if we know it's happening then we can start to think about well what are we doing what what, what can we do better how can we discourage this from happening what are, what's the message we need to get out there to people uh, and it's again it's having those eyes and ears on the ground which help us deliver that I just wanted to use the hill forts and habitats project as a as an example of just how fantastic and how successful our heart volunteers can be for us and again this is a this is a Hamilton Hill which we saw at the beginning um, and this is a fantastic aerial view of Hamilton Hill uh, it, overlooking the um, uh, Blackmore Vale in Dorset and Hamilton Hill is one of a series of uh, large Iron Age hill forts that, that, that we um, uh, are on our land across Dorset and Wiltshire um, where we did um, extensive survey work and um, we discovered that, you know, both in terms of nature, so nature um, uh, conservation and uh, archaeological condition, they were in poor condition. And in fact, four of the sites were on the Historic England at risk register, not something that a conservation charity could be very proud of. Um, so as 
in an attempt to try and you know uh, reverse this position um, we employed uh, teams of volunteers who went out and did major surveys of all these sites highlighting where all the issues were and what those issues were those surveys and the the, res the reports that were generated on those surveys were then acted upon by the local ranger team and here we see the ranger team doing repairs to a, a bridleway that runs through the middle of hod hill um, a large iron age hill fort which is very close to hamilton hill and clearing um, invasive scrub and young trees off the ramparts at Hod Hill. Um, and you can get more information about the project if you go to the website. Um, and as a result of that work, as a result of the work that the volunteers did in, and, and the, the, the efforts that the ranger team did, this is the situation at the end of that project. Uh, and so, as you can see, with significant improvement with those four monuments being taken off the at-risk register uh, and generally speaking really good improvement across the board on all of those sites so so a real example of where those volunteers were fundamental they were front and center of actually going out getting the data that allowed us to take those actions and, and make sure that we prioritize the appropriate actions um, to lead to lead to those improvements don't just take my word for it. Our volunteers, you know, we get extremely good and positive feedback from our volunteers who who enjoy the opportunity to get out, enjoy the opportunity to get out into the countryside and 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 look around these sites and and understand the the contribution they make to us. Um, we also get fantastic feedback from our own colleagues, uh, both in terms of our volunteer and community engagement colleagues, but also our ranger teams who support these groups. Um, and and that's really positive. That's really that's really uh, nice when you get that kind of feedback. And I just wanted to finish by just highlighting the Heritage uh, Records Online website. This is something that um, uh, a website that we run, the National Trust runs, um, uh, where you can go and you can. Um, see what's in your local area so um, if you go to the page and you click on the open map this map on the right opens up each of those red dots is a national trust property and if you zoom in on those then the archaeology appears as a as a layer of information uh, and this is the method by which we uh, collect um, data from our um, heart volunteers so heart volunteers can register as uh, hro users and that gives them an enhanced uh, access which allows them to upload data onto the system and upload photographs onto the system um, but at, to be absolutely clear and i do want to make this point um, to become a heart volunteer there has to be a heart team running at the property that you're interested in volunteering on and at the moment not all our properties have heart groups so if you're interested in volunteering and you, you you you're struggling to find out whether there's a heart group exists or not we're going to suggest that you contact us by using the contact us button on hro so if you go to hro you'll see the top page is contact us use that send us an email tell us where you live what you, you know where you are uh, and that you're interested in joining a heart group and we can then explore whether there's a heart group that already exists if there isn't we can get back to you and let you know there isn't one uh, and we can also possibly keep you in um uh, in mind if we get a future heart group setting up in that particular area so um that's where i'm gonna finish and stop sharing wonderful thank you very much Thank you, Duncan. And and you're right. Sorry, I um yeah I didn't sort of articulate the connection between what you were talking about and the the monument mentors that Gary was talking about. But but it is yeah. And and we are growing. The whole point about the Heart Initiative is that we are growing it. So there will be hopefully more opportunities in the future. But um I think some of those comments and I hope people had time to read them. There's the, the sort of feedback that's coming through from the Heart Volunteers about doing something worthwhile, about working with people about and actually some of the some of the heart volunteers are people who have volunteered in other capacities in the national trust and they're, they're having a go at doing something quite different it's giving them a real range of experience at our places which is a great great opportunity to have um but because i have to make it at least one comical point i will say that not only are people loving trig points there's also i'm pretty sure there's a whole instagram on dogs on trig points right dogs on trigs something like that um of which i know people guilty of that so yeah it's dogs and people causing damage at trig point um just wanted to 
you know, be fair there. Um, so we have had some questions. Yes, there is. <laughs> uh, someone has put in the chat. Yes, there is. And I think you are guilty of it as well. Um, yes, there's been a few questions coming through. So what I'm going to do is, um, and Neil may come off speaker, you don't have to if you don't want to, but um, we'll just sort of go through the questions and aim them at uh, various people. Um, the first question that came in, and apologies if they've left a few people have had to go. Um, we've only got about eight minutes left of our um, of our presentation this evening. Uh, so Thea was asking Natalie about um, dating pottery. Now, obviously, there's there's sort of various ways that we date pottery, but um, in particular with reference to the Roman pottery. Um, Nat, do you just want to sort of answer how it is that we know like the dates of Roman pottery and how we kind of work out the chronology of those things? So we've been really lucky at Small Hive to work with an amazing uh, Roman pot specialist called Malcolm Lyne. So all of our pottery has been sent to Malcolm over the last two years, um, and he's an expert in the Roman pottery of Kent and Sussex and has been working for decades. So has a really amazing understanding of all of the established typologies. So he's able to identify for us and to date, looking at the forms and looking at the fabric. So he's been able to tell us whether we've got locally made wares. We have quite a lot coming from the East Sussex area, just over the border. We have material coming from North Kent, and then we also have imported ware, so material that's coming through uh, from Gaul. So all of those uh, artifacts are, are well established sequences because Roman archaeology and Roman uh, ceramic typologies are so well uh, understood on the whole. So we can see where ours uh, fits into those wider uh, chronologies. And um, particularly when we're getting imported materials as well coming from the continent. Uh, so things like amphora, some of the mortaria, the same in where I mentioned and so on. So um, it's been really exciting to learn a bit more about the dating and the chronology of that pottery. And, and it helps us to establish the, the time span for that activity, um, possibly in two phases. We're not entirely clear yet, but there seems to be a a focus in the first century and then potentially a second sort of wave of activity in the second and third centuries. Brilliant, thank you. And yeah, just uh, in a sort of more broad terms, largely speaking in sort of more historical periods, we have a lot um, we have a lot more information to tie pottery typologies to, but when you're talking about prehistoric pottery, we, we are still shifting the chronologies of quite a lot of prehistoric potteries in different parts um, of the UK because a lot often, often how we date that is by um, backing it up with radiocarbon dates from the soil or the deposit that they were found in um, or, or bone or something like that that we can actually throw a date at. So, so some of the earlier sort of um, chronologies for prehistoric pottery has come through that way. But as I say, it's, it is still being refined, actually. Um, right, and the next couple of questions are for Mark. Um, so Louise was just asking about the last picture that you put up on your slide, uh, which was the sort of um, perspective view of your sort of grand, this is what it could be again one day. Um, and she, oh, there was it gone. Yeah, uh, she was just asking if that was Benenborough. And there was also another little quick question, sort of connected. Did you find a possible fountain? Yep, um, I can pick those up. Great, thank um, you. <clears throat> so I've been racking my brains trying to remember where that that place was, and I'm guarantee that I will remember about thirty seconds after this. But it's not broadcast finish. It's not her, but it is not Bing. Benningborough. And kind of the point is, we would love to make one of Benningborough. Nobody, very few people, ever seem to have visited Benningborough, so there's not much stuff out there. But it'd be great if we could draw our own version of an 18th century perspective view. We're close. As regards the fountain, thank you for the question, Catherine. Uh, you're absolutely dead right. That is what the lovely people from Rose to the Past will have talked to you about. We found the concrete base and part of the, well, the foundations and part of the bowl of the fountain, which is the one you could see in the black and white photograph of the, Ed, of the Edwardian garden. Um, but archaeologically, it was really interesting. It's great to touch something that you've got that sort of evidence for. Um, but the entire structure was dug into a, an enormous deep landscaping layer, which we think is of late 18th century date. So it really gave the stratigraphy of the Edwardian stuff visited on top of this uh, later Georgian deposit. And that deposit, 
I really should emphasize is such good news for what we're planning to do, that we think that just about all of the interventions for the 21st century garden will only intersect that landscaping layer. So the really fascinating, fragile stuff from the earlier gardens will be protected underneath for future investigation. Wonderful. Thank you, Mark. Um, next, we're a quick one for, actually, there's a couple for Gary here. Um, how many mentors have you recruited so far, Gary? Uh, so there's about 60 people who I'm kind of frequently emailing, but they don't all come out to every event, obviously, and it's dependent on their schedules and, and what they can do. Uh, some of the things I'm, I'm tr trying to do on weekends to obviously get a kind of different demographic out. Uh, but this is I'm so glad you asked this question because it gives me a chance to say this um, that the, the core idea at the end of it is the fact that you could do this just on your by yourself on a normal walk out. Um, all you need is to, to know, uh, have the questions really that you want to ask about a monument and and take a few photos. There are resources that we have been produced alongside the South House National Park and Historic England with the National Trust uh, as to resources that tell you how to do it and and how to what to look for and kind of recording sheets and so these are things that are going to be available on the changing chalk website very uh, soon if you email me i'll be able to send you a copy um but yeah you could do this as part of your walk uh, walking the dog cycling anything if you come across these monuments go onto the historic england website have a look at the map around where you live there's probably some nearby if you live out in the countryside there's probably some urban ones as well um you know these are these are this is something that you don't have to be part of a big organized group and then with the data you can put it onto the missing pieces project on the historic england website um so yeah it's it, i've got about 60 people but i'm hoping that it's going to spread and more and more people will do it um and it could be something that's done nationally really um you're hoping that heritage becomes contagious right hopefully yeah um and someone else has popped up a question on the original slide there was a key for heath in green uh, is the heathland being extended to and what's what about the archaeology that's linked to it what do you know about that so the heathland i don't know what work is being done on the heathland so that is so there is a um i've obviously do more kind of archaeology stuff there is rangers that have been employed through the chasey chalk project um they've they've worked a lot on uh chalk grass so i don't know whether anyone has done specifically anything to do with the heathland because it is a different habitat it is almost um there we go so james has answered in the uh, there's some work heathlands reunited uh has done a national heritage lottery fund project that did focus on archaeology um that's, 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 thanks for that james um but i don't know of any work that's happening specifically in that in that heathland however it is something that again needs to be protected and it is it's a different environment to the changing chalk uh the chalk grassland that we're looking at but it is a complementary one and it would be mm. good to have more of that heathland as well so it sounds like some work has been done in that um and that natural uh, heritage lottery fund project originally which probably fed into some of the designs for changing chalk in the first yeah. place so um yeah there'll probably be more work on that area because it is so special um there is a there is a biggie here and uh i will uh, maybe I'll just decide who should answer it first, but I, all four of you could probably have a go. Neil, you might want to have a go at this one too. Uh, well, actually, no, it's not with the National Trust, but generally in your career. What has been the most impactful archaeological find or discovery so far? And I'll just put in brackets in your career with the National Trust. So I'll throw that at my team first. Mark's straight in there with the hands, but I'd love to get Neil's, in, Neil's uh, answer to that one too. Mark, do you sure. want to go first? I will. I found a drain once. <laughs> but the drain was going through the monastic cemetery at Fountains oh. and the geophysics that we used to look at the drain we discovered was capable of identifying the graves and when we worked on the graves we found you think kind of cemetery is the same thing throughout no there are about eight different zones and different burial practices that represent the evolution of theology over the 400 years of the life of the monastery from that it started casting questions about the lay brethren which you, you scale up to being how did they recruit so many lay brethren without it completely impacting the economics of the north of england so it's quite a good drain it was quite a good drain yeah i've seen i've seen the images of that drain and what it goes through it is very impressive um nat do you want to have a have a go at that one i will i lost you all there briefly for a moment oh, but i'm back. Um, back uh the most impactful um 
I guess in terms of story, being able to tell a story, it's probably the message in a bottle that uh, was found by the volunteer team at Knoll. Uh, and I was lucky enough to be there when we were able to lift it out with a hoover. Um, it was a message in a bottle from uh, Sydney Doggett, who is a, an estate worker at Knoll, um, who left us a message saying that he had installed the heating and the hot water service in the early years of the 1900s. Um, he'd left graffiti as well all over the building. Uh, so we, know, we knew that he'd worked there from 1898 until 1960. So a very long career of working at Knoll and through that discovery and sort of sharing that story, we were able to connect with his family who came and visited and sort of got to see their great granddad's message in a bottle and left us his uh, toolbox to add to our collections at Knoll. So it was a really, uh, it doesn't involve the whole of the north of England, but it's such a personal uh, sort of contact with a with an individual from the past that was a really yeah. great discovery and had, you know, had lots of legs, if you like. So lots of different uh, things that the property team could explore. Um, and it involved working a lot with our volunteer team, looking at the oral histories uh, of the place, so people who lived and, and worked at Knoll. So I, for me, that was a really uh, impactful discovery that just came from a, uh, it was a Perrier bottle as well, which was quite yeah. quite instantly recognisable and yet over 100 years old. So. Yeah, it's incredible. Um, uh, Duncan, that might be a slightly harder one for you to answer because you don't do the same sorts of work. So I'm going to go, and Gary, I might come back to you, but Neil, I don't know if you want to, I mean, it's obviously outside of the trust, but if you uh, if you want to throw anything in, like what's the most impactful thing that you found? Okay, um, so it's a brick, and it's a brick with. Better the... go somewhere good, Neil. <laughs> uh, well, no, it's a brick with the name Castleford or Castleford on it, and it relates to the fact that when Pesler wrote his architectural guides uh, for uh, for for the UK, he told the architectural recorder that they should never visit Castleford because there was not a single building of architectural merit there. This then led to the community thinking they had no heritage or they had no worth. Um, and we were doing some work in Castleford um, and talking to the community. And then on a site visit, looking at some Iron Age um, square barrows, we, we, myself and a colleague, Keith Emmerich, we wandered off to the Second World War airfield, which was far more exciting. And we were rummaging in the woodland um, at the dispersal pens and kicked one kicked over a lump of brick and it turned out to be made in Castleford. And so the next time we went to that community, we were able to tell them that they built the airfields that actually helped defeat the, the Nazis. And so actually, no, heritage is about the stories you create and the, and the messages. And I can tell you now, I find Castleford bricks all over the north of England. And what they're associated with building is absolutely fascinating, primarily um, between the 1930s and the 1950s, there seems to be a, a really big um, brick industry. And then um, 10 years ago, I bought a house, which turns out to be entirely made of Castleford bricks. And 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 I curse them every single day because they're the <laughs> hardest bricks I've ever come across. And I blunt my drills trying to put pictures up uh, okay. with these things. So impact relates to how you use the material you find. And for me, that was the simplest thing but actually has the most impact because of the connections you, I can make with it. Mm, that's incredible. Gary, do you want to try and follow that? Yes, um, I will slightly, because I haven't done a whole lot of digging with the uh, National Trust in my in my year here, although I have, we have found some decent stuff. I can't really talk about it, so I'll, I'll leave that. Um, I can't talk about it yet. Um, I think I'll reinterpret it slightly and say one of the most impactful things I've found is how interested so many of the people that um, I get to speak to are and how much knowledge they have about archaeology and stuff like this, despite the fact they don't have any kind of, uh, you know, formal qualifications or anything like that in it. Um, and this is including kind of the young people as well and how much, you know, I could I could hear, hear these, these young people talking about these, about, about history in this area. It's like, oh, wow, I didn't know any of this. And it's like really interesting that they've just got a genuine passion and, and they're really keen to engage. And I think that's been kind of really impactful for me because I'm like, oh, this is great. This is really giving, this project's really giving uh, these young people a kind of outlet for all their enthusiasm and their knowledge and their creativity. And it's, uh, yeah, it's like kind of like fizzing up a bottle of Coke and then banging the lid off. And it's just giving them a chance to kind of 
talk about it and think about it and then kind of like the flow I, flow of ideas and stuff um yeah that's awesome um i've just had a quick message uh because a few people have dropped out there is a poll um at the end of this uh so just for a little bit of feedback that we would love everybody to answer everybody who's still here on the call um so please stay on for that if you can or if debbie is going to put it i'm not sure if you can put it up yet debbie um but the last question that we have in the q a area is um I don't, I don't know if you can see it duncan it's quite a biggie um so it's it's asking about training and uh information for heart um and who sort of leads the teams does it have to be an archaeologist and, and i can tell you now that absolutely no it doesn't have to be but duncan do you want to go into that one a little bit more oh i've lost duncan so that's my fault i was on there mute. we go you were muted <laughs> had to be one <laughs> it's always always happens isn't it now absolutely uh, most of the teams um are you know self-led uh, that often there's a lead volunteer who, you know, does the coordination and sets up dates and makes sure there are people who are available to do those things. Each group gets uh, training uh, provided by the property team and by the local archaeologist, uh, depending on where they are in the country. Um, and we're also producing training materials that will be available to people so that if they miss the training or if they need a refresher, there'll be material available to them to pick up um, from our, from our uh, website or, or an appropriate place. Um, and then if they've got questions, if they come across something in the field they're not sure about, then they'll they'll have the appropriate contacts to be able to get in touch with to ask ask questions about you know those sorts of issues that, that, that come up on as a result of being out in the field um, but you know absolutely there's no reason why you need to have any training as an archaeologist you don't need to be a, an archaeologist uh, to be a heart volunteer um, and, and in fact you know we're very keen you know to get people from a wide variety of backgrounds and, and in interests because um, we think that you know we get more out of it that way um, and and I think the groups get more out of it that way as well um, so absolutely we when a group set up we will provide the train initial training but there will also be training material available yeah brilliant thank you um right debbie has popped the poll up so everyone who is still with us if you could answer that we'd be very very grateful for your feedback um but i think as far as i can tell the questions are kind of questions are kind of yep i think they've come to an end which is terrific um i just want to on behalf of the National Trust thank the CBA again for hosting us. Um, it's just a pleasure to do this every year. I really enjoy it. Um, so long may this continue. But more importantly, thank you to all of the people who have come along to listen this evening. Um, and I'm just going to do one special shout out. Uh, if he's, he might not be there and I'll embarrass him, but Dan, who is from uh, is in San Francisco, who is one of my dad's best friends. Uh, so it's real. I was really chuffed to see you on there, Dan. That meant a lot to me. So um, yeah. So for everybody who joined, I hope you've enjoyed the evening um, and please please go out and seek out more festival of archaeology activities in your local area national trust places or beyond um, and back over to neil to close thank you brilliant thank you just just on um, some of the stuff that duncan was talking about the cba is really interesting how we can roll out that approach to the wider um country um one challenge we do have is there is no public access to schedule monuments um and so it it works really well where you know the landowner uh and you can actually gain that permission so i just just advise everyone just because it's scheduled doesn't mean you can suddenly go and walk and look at it um please be careful um that's in my guise as a former um field monument warden and inspector of ancient monuments um but i love the work that both duncan and gary are doing i think it, it's got lots of lots of mileage uh in actually rolling it out and it'd be great to see how that actually develops um, I'm absolutely delighted that the, the trust could join us again this year. I've, I've learned lots and just listening to, to everyone is, is absolutely fascinating. And I think I need to have a, have a word with Mark Newman about actually taking a trip just, just those short eight miles north of York <laughs> from where I live to uh, Benningborough to have a look at those excavations next week. Um, but everyone else, the Festival of Archaeology is not a week old yet. 
Um, so that means we've got plenty of days. There's still still over 10 days of uh, Festival of Archaeology events and activities to um, get involved with. Head over to our website, um, www.archaeologyuk.org, and you can find the links to the festival and all the activities there. Go on to the National Trust website. They've got even more events and activities you can go and have a look at there, which is really brilliant, and I'm truly grateful. If you're into your online talks and lectures, we have another This Is Archaeology lecture next week. Uh, this Is Archaeology lectures are free during the festival. This one is exploring the work of Nina Francis Layard um, in the early 20th, in, sorry, in the, in the 19th century and her writings about being a female um, archaeologist. Um, so um, that's um, um, going to be presented by Dr. Schubert Robert Williams. And I know that's really fascinating. And again, picking up on the theme of archaeology and creativity. So do go onto our website and you can sign up for that. That'll be fantastic. Um, Debbie's done the poll. Um, please, everyone, thank you so much for actually joining in. Um, and thank you again to the National Trust archaeologists. Their, their help really does actually you know, bring archaeology during the festival to life. And I'm really grateful for all the work they do. And as ever, if you've got any questions, Please do just drop us emails. Or all our contact details are on our on our website or, or or to the National Trust archaeologists, and we'll be happy to pick up any conversations with you. But for now and tonight, thank you all. Safe journeys home or to whichever room in your house you're now going to move to. Um, and um, we are very grateful for all of your attendance. Thank you. Thank you, everyone.